mountains, beautiful things. Personally, I love the fresh air of a cold, tall mountain, blanketed with snow. It is an awesome thing to look upon the world from such magnificent peace of nature. Quite sad I'll never climb the tallest mountain known to humankind. It isn't on Earth. I don't really think I'll be climbing any mountains for a while, though. I am a paleontologist, you see. Sometimes we go to distant mountains, deserts, to go look for fossils. It's a fun job, but hell does it get weird sometimes. But this occurrence in the mountains just takes the cake for me. A few weeks ago, I got a strange notification from an anonymous person going by the name of Quinton Smog. They contacted me by text and told me that, well, they discovered an odd temple in the mountains of Asia I should look at. I don't do temples. I do dinosaurs, I typed. I know, Quinton replied. Let's just say this mountain may hold the key to the Permian extinction. Now that caught my attention. You see, the Permian extinction, also called the Great Dying, was an event in Earth's history. A mass extinction that wiped out 90% of all life on the planet. Almost all the trees died. 5% of animal life in the ocean survived. While on land, only a third of all species managed to live. You can really tell how this captured my attention. But still, I was worried it was a prank. My brother, Jack Mayflower, loves to send me all sorts of made-up conspiracy theories. So here I am, Jamie Mayflower, intrigued and hoping this information was true. So I shot back a text. Prove it. I immediately was sent these odd images of dozens of Permian-era fossils ranging from Gorgonospids, the first saber-tooths, to things I couldn't even imagine existed. I sent them to a friend of mine, Alicia, a biologist who confirmed that the photos seemed correct enough. I sent photos to a good friend, who verified they weren't photoshopped. Okay, where's the mountain? I questioned. I'm in. Creasing mountain, was the reply. I smiled. I'll have a team ready in a week. But here's the thing. That mountain doesn't exist. See, when I searched it up before to verify it was real, it did exist. I saw several websites promoting it, but now, when I search up Creasing Mountain, you get nothing. Anyway, I did assemble a team in a week. My brother, the bell tower joined me, as well as some of his friends, Cannon, Jacob, and Melissa. They were a good bunch, although I kept my distance. We boarded a plane to take in the general area, and before we knew it, we were in this odd little town, Creasing. Supposedly, the mountain was named after it, and it had a deep, rich history. This town doesn't show up on internet searches either. Quinton Smog, I asked, seeing someone who matched the clothes the contacts said they'd wear. Grey hat, oddly dark purple hair, and a grey coat. That's me, they hissed, staring into my soul. Something about their eyes seemed like they were probing my mind for everything I knew. Cool, Jack said. The temple, Jamie's dinosaurs. Up the mountain, Quinton explained. Oh, I added, they aren't dinosaurs. Dinosaurs came after the Permian extinction. Right, Jack muttered. Up the mountain, I asked, hopeful. I'll show the way, get everything ready, and meet me back here in an hour. And for the next hour, things were fine. Or so it seemed. For me, I just found out more about the town's history, including an odd legend that spoke of an odd temple, supposedly in the clouds, created by a superior race of beings, called the Ricadians, or something like that. The legend spoke that a thousand years ago, the people who lived in the mountains saw a bizarre light appear from the sky, and that two strange people appeared 
seemingly out of nowhere. The two people led the town to the temple in the clouds, and when the two people stepped inside the temple, the temple glowed all sorts of colours. The legend also speaks of another strange light in the sky, a ball of fire that burned all that touched it, and that the two people in the temple used the power of the structure to destroy the ball of fire. After that, the strange people disappeared in a flash of light. It was an odd legend, but nothing I'd wondered before. And the hour passed, and soon, me and the team were hiking up the mountain. Nothing odd happened the first day, but I remember Melissa complaining of this awful headache. Maybe that was a sign things were going to be disastrous. The second we stopped to rest at a strange little river that winded down into a waterfall, Jack asked me if I'd been hearing odd things. Like, what things? I asked. I don't know, he replied. I've just heard the strangest things while climbing. It's this odd sound that sounds like it's coming from above the mountain. Probably nothing. The next weird thing was when I accidentally turned on my radio. I knew radios don't work at all at the altitude we were at, and like I said, it was an accident. I was looking for my knife when my hand brought out my radio, accidentally turning it on instinctively. But there was something. Opera. It was so beautiful too, unlike anything I'd ever heard before. It sounded like the trees, the sunset, the river, like it was all harmonising, speaking to me and with me. I was stuck in this trance of listening to it until Cannon, one of the archaeologists, found me. You've heard it too, he spoke. The opera. I just found out, I murmured, turning off my radio and the haunting noise. I wonder where it's coming from. Try turning your radio on again. I did. The opera was gone, only replaced by dead static. Where is it? I questioned. Dunno, Cannon responded. I've tried looking for it, but it only appeared to me once too. With that, Cannon left, moving out of sight to explore some cool rocks he found with Melissa. That was the last time I saw Cannon alive. The two were gone for hours, and the rest of us looked for them, but we couldn't find them. We were getting desperate, and the moon stared at us, mocking us from the skies. We were just about to give up when Melissa appeared from the jungle, screaming and crying in horror at something. Melissa! Jack shouted, alerting the rest of us. What happened? Melissa babbled incoherently, screaming something about the noise and something about the sky. We fed her soup as we waited for the night to pass. It was all too quiet, as if all the animals in the world were hiding from a predator unseen. Quentin Smog, when asked if he'd encountered this phenomenon, simply shrugged and told us not to worry. Me and Jacob looked for Cannon while Jack nursed Melissa back to sanity. We didn't find him. We found his backpack a distance away on top of a bizarre rectangular monolith, with strange indents and markings all over it. It was far too tall for someone to have climbed up, and stranger still, it was coated with an odd, moist substance. Jacob used a stick and got the backpack down. The backpack was shredded and in pieces. It was as if it had been mauled by an animal, but... What sort of animal could have gotten it on top of that stone pillar? I don't know, but that night I dreamt of the opera, being in the audience while a strange yet familiar woman sang the magnificent song. When I awoke, Jack was out of breath, just outside camp. What happened? I inquired. Melissa, he began, sighing. I... I couldn't stop her. What? She ran, Jamie, Jack explained. I thought she was asleep, but then she ran. It's... it's all my fault. She kept talking about the sky and a pillar in the woods and... Did you just say a pillar in the woods? I asked. Yes, why? Jack questioned. She kept going on and on about cannon, 
and finding this stone pillar in the woods. Then, she... She said when Cannon touched the pillar, well... Jack paused. The sky ate him. She said when he touched the rock, the blue sky bent down and suddenly he wasn't there. He was just gone. There was this folding blue dot where he was, and then the dot vanished. Oh my god, I murmured. I saw that pillar. I thanked myself for not touching it earlier. Where? I tried to show him. I really did. We woke up Jacob, and we went searching for the pillar. The pillar wasn't there. Where we left the pillar was Melissa. But no, not really. It wasn't her. It just looked like her. At the time, we thought it was her. Melissa? I asked. You doing okay? Yeah, she replied. Why? Yesterday, Jack reminded. Sorry, she replied. I've been listening to too much opera. Those words instantly made me feel a deep, crawling fear I'd never felt before. We didn't know what to do then. Melissa denied seeing Cannon disappear, only that she said Cannon decided to go back to the village by himself, and told her to tell the others. She said what happened yesterday was likely because of some strange berries she ate. Somehow, I knew she was lying. That she wasn't Melissa. We continued up the mountain, and that day, we found it. The temple. It was large, gold, and nothing like I'd ever seen before. Jack, Jacob, and whatever was pretending to be Melissa, all marvelled at it. And me? I marvelled over Permian-era fossils that were too well-preserved, too neat, too large, too convenient. I don't like it, I complained. Everything's too well-preserved. We're lucky, Jack replied. That's all. I don't know, I murmured. I don't think any of this is going well. That night, I barely slept. I tossed and turned, and when I did, I dreamt about Melissa. She was cowering in a corner of the temple, and I saw that this odd blue thing was searching for her. This blue sky, a piece of it chasing after her, and Melissa hiding, but there was no escape. The sky blue thing found her and wrapped itself over and over again around her screaming body, until there was nothing left. I woke up in the dead of night to hear footsteps. I looked out of my tent to see Melissa and Jacob, listening to the radio, to opera that seemed magnificent, yet unknown. Then, I saw it. The sky was reaching towards them, tentacles of pale blue in the moonlight. I saw that Jacob saw nothing as the sky wrapped itself around him. He screamed, but I heard nothing but opera. He thrashed in pain, but I did nothing. And soon, there was nothing but pale blue sky. And then, I saw the strangest thing. It was the guide... The contact, Quintin Smog, they were suddenly behind Melissa and they, they stabbed her with this knife. It was curved, serrated, and it had all these odd symbols all over it, but it happened. They stabbed her through the throat, and I saw the blade impale her. She let out a gasp, and then I saw these light blue lines, like snakes, slither out of her and float into the sky. And then, suddenly, her entire body was a million different snaking lines, vanishing into the night air, and left behind was a pale, sky-blue cube that the guide smiled and pocketed. The next day was the final day. Everyone was gone except for me, Jack, and Quinton. It was all too loud, the noises of the animals, the birds, a contrast to the silent, eerie past days. The fossils I'd seen yesterday were gone. They weren't anywhere. Even the ones I'd bagged were gone, only replaced with air. Jack, too, complained about the same thing. All the pottery and artefacts in the temple was empty, like they had never even existed to begin with. I wonder what this means, I murmured. It means, Quinton spoke, 
some apple-like fruit in hand. I'd seen them take one from a tree. We need to go back. Me and Jack silently agreed. All of us silently packed our things and began to head back down the mountain. I looked back one final time, but the temple was gone. It had never existed. Later, as me and Jack drove away from the town of Creasing, I looked back, and behind me, there was nothing. Where there was a mountain, now there was nothing. No words of mine can truly describe what happened those days in the mountains. It's too... not bizarre, perhaps. Operatic. That's it. That's the word. Operatic. Operatic.